Thank you, Olivia and Dakota. That stirred our spirits. Really. I, uh, that's the second time the youth have stirred our spirit. We were stirred this morning. Uh, I looked at those uh, girls, not to uh, overlook the two boys, but the, the greater number that was here this morning, uh, standing up here with the girls. And uh, I thought about there's the uh, Christian women, wives, mothers of tomorrow. Uh, that's inspiring, and y'all were inspiring uh, with your song. Wonderful. Um, Jesus. Uh, we can do all things through Jesus, right? We know that because the Word tells us that in Philippians 4, 13. Just wanted to open up with a, a word there about Jesus. Uh, the subject tonight is prayer and uh, how prayer might play out in us here at Chunky Baptist Church. We're going to uh, kind of spring from uh, the same scripture that I talked from a little bit on Wednesday night, and that is from Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. If you would please turn with me to Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. And I read. And it came, and it, this, is, this is Joshua speaking to the people of Israel and therefore speaking to us. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua mentioned the fact that there's uh, different gods to serve. Among the ones he mentioned there, uh, obviously that's not the true and living Lord God, our creator, but it's false God. One that he mentioned was uh, the false God that even uh, Abraham, his father, that, that's amazing that, that God looked at Abraham and he called him not because of any pedigree, because it says here, that uh, Abraham's uh, forefathers worshipped other gods. And then we're given uh, a second example that says the gods of the Amorites. There, in this culture of 2024, there are infinite gods that can detract us from the Lord God. Um, the list is too long to name, but to touch on a, a group, sports. It's easy in sports, uh, whether it's a sport you like or the sport I like, it's easy to cross the line from it being a sport that we enjoy uh, to it uh, becoming a God to us. Uh, Sherry and I uh, spend a good bit of time in Houston. We lived there before we moved to Chunky. And uh, there's one sport in Houston, I won't name the sport because it would seem like I'm condemning that particular one, but it's a version of ball. And Sunday morning is the preferred time when that is played mostly. And uh, that's where the crowds are on Sunday morning, in participating in that sport. It's another version of the false gods that are around us. And here's the thing about it with Young people, remember when we were young, we, young people are easily impressed. And a constant example around you becomes an accepted norm, even when that constant reference around you is wrong. Uh, that's illustrated um, in the very next book, uh, after, after Joshua, we're told in uh, the following book there in Judges, uh, and I'm going to read from Judges chapter 2 and uh, verses 10 through 12. Joshua has just died, and there's a change in leadership, and things don't go well. And listen, and this, this brings out the point 
of what happens when we don't serve the true and living Lord God. And by the way, here's, a, here's something to think about. Um, we're created uh, with a need to fill a void. God created us that way. And that need is going to be filled one way or the other. Of course, God intended that we fill it with He through Jesus and through His Word. And when any person turns away from the way that God intended for it to be filled with He, His Word, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, there's a void, but not very long. Voids never last long. They're always filled with something. Reading here in Joshua chapter, excuse me, Judges chapter 2, starting with 10 and going through 12. And all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. That's talking about the generation that lived and served with Joshua. And all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done in Israel. Think about all the children of this community that is unchurched. They're like it says right here. If they never get God's word, they don't know what is there for them. Continuing on with verse 11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Verse 12. And this is, this is really significant here in verse 12. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. All right, that created the void. <coughs> but look how it's filled. Which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people round about them. We, it doesn't have to be chunky. It can be Cincinnati or Chicago or San Francisco or Miami, Florida or any place in between. The prevailing culture is anti-Christian. And that prevailing culture can either influence us or we influence them. Regarding our interactions with the world, we only have three choices. We either can influence, we can try to ignore it, or we can imitate it. And too often, without intending to, we can be persuaded by the wrong culture around us, and uh, we began to imitate. Joshua said, you gotta make a choice. Which God are you gonna serve? All these false gods are the true and living God. <clears throat> we all make choices, and, and perhaps one of the most deceiving choices to make is a passive choice. Well, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I remember standing at the apartment door in, uh, many years ago in Baton Rouge, and uh, I uh, knocked on the door and I was there to invite the man to our church. And he said, uh, and it's real vivid to me, uh, what he told me, he said, well, I'm not uh, good enough yet and I'm, I'm going to clean up my life and then I'll think about coming. Uh, no, uh, that is not the way it works. Uh, we can't be good enough. Even right here in Newton County, we have a significant population that they don't realize it, but they have a a understanding of works. I've talked with a person within the last two weeks and talked about their spiritual condition. And I asked the key question, well, in your opinion, how do you get to heaven? Their answer was, well, you got to be pretty good. See, they've been influenced by the world 
rather than being influenced by us. We, it takes our deliberate, intentional faith to influence the world around us. How do we influence the world? Well, among the answers is Jesus, faith, prayer, vision. You know, what's the, the vision that's in your heart is usually what you'll uh, strive toward. I'm like a lot of you all, I work for <laughs> more than 40 years. My vision was to get back to Mississippi. The Lord took me on a long path to a lot of other areas. My vision was to get back to Mississippi. And I strive to do that. Praise the Lord. He blessed Sherry and I to, to come back. The, the point is, what is our vision as a church? I read and reread a book uh, written by Leonard Ravenhill in 1959, and it's invigorating and it's fresh, probably because it's from 1959. It didn't have the influences of all this culture. And Leonard Ravenhill makes this statement in his final. He says, "No man or person can live beyond their vision." And then he quotes Proverbs 29:18. Where there's no vision, the people perish. And the next thing he said, really it stuck with me. He said, where there's no passion, the church perishes. Ooh. What is our vision? What is our passion? You know, when you think about passion, you think about not something that you just go through the motions but it's something in you from your heart. One of the things I think about is these Kleenex boxes sitting in the windows. I think they're from the 1980s. <laughs> Little Ravenhill said, our eyes are dry because our hearts are dry. Where's our passion, our vision to win the world around us? What is, what is uh, Chunky Baptist Church's vision? Well, the Lord has given to Pastor Charles that three-part vision for this year, is it? Pursuing prayer, promoting joy, and proclaiming Jesus. Girls, when y'all sang a moment ago, I thought about that part of joy. Because you brought joy. <laughs> it was like uh, the Holy Spirit's presence. And, and, and Pastor Charles and the Lord is leading us in those three parts. Pursuing prayer, <clears throat> uh, promoting joy, and proclaiming Jesus. I want to uh, call a second point that Joshua brought out there in 2415. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Always, uh, the first thing I think we all do, and it's correct to, to uh, get the meaning, our house, where we live. We've got to get it right personally before we can get it right at, at church and school and work. We can agree on that. We've got to get it right personally. So he said, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But you know, also then, getting it right person to person, our house, and then our church, uh, Chunky, Baptist, Chunky Baptist Church. Colossians 1.17 says, Jesus is the head of the church. And then there's Pastor Charles, the under shepherd. And then we, the congregation. We, under the lead, under the under shepherd guidance of Pastor Charles, under the guidance of Jesus, the head of the church, we have a responsibility. If there's a family that lives right over there, a family that lives right over here, and I never pray for them or don't make contact with them, 
I'm failing. I like to say it this way. Um, we're all going to stand in front of Jesus. Scripture says that. I think it's uh, Romans 12, 4. I, the Scripture says we'll all give an account and stand before Jesus. And when I stand before Jesus, I'll not have to answer for what went on in Chicago or St. Louis or Memphis or anything that went on between here and there. I'm going to tell you it gives me heart. Remember that I have responsibility for these families around here. Passion. Last, I believe last Sunday or two Sundays ago, one of the points that Pastor Charles brought out was the three attributes that was, uh, signifies and test testifies to the presence of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it's given in uh, uh, Colossians, thankfulness, <clears throat> joy, and submission. Um, we have Holy Spirit's presence with us. And if we submit to God, we can have that passion that reaches the world around us. Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. You, that serving can be defined in many ways. I think about you, uh, Brother Gary, and all the many ways you've served the Lord. You work with uh, so many young people. Pam, I think about you. I live next door here, and I have a view of a lot of people that come and do work here uh, during the week, and I can name many others. There's many ways of serving the Lord. Uh, one of the ways that's mentioned in Scripture is labor. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 9, 10, along there says, we're laborers together with God. Prayer. By the way, we're going to conclude uh, here in just short few minutes. We're going to conclude with a, a, a prayer session for anybody that wants, wants to pray before we have the uh, invitation. Uh, regarding laboring, I often, I, I, I've been led to ask this question over the last many years. I, I, I get the opportunity to bring the word in many different settings. And <clears throat> I've asked of many different groups through the recent years, is praying difficult? Is praying difficult? Uh, if I can't swim and I fall out of the boat without a life jacket in the lake, uh, prayer comes pretty quick and easy. But that's not the kind of prayer that cuts the mustard. Real life-changing prayer is it difficult. We, that question is answered for us <clears throat> in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Epirus, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Laboring fervently in prayer. I offer to you that praying is indeed a labor. But through the labor of prayer and the faith in Jesus, we can influence the world rather than them influencing us. We're told in James that the use of King James language in James 
chapter 5, verse 16. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does what? Avails much. The, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man changes the world. Think about uh, somebody in your life that has exemplified effectual, fervent, laboring type of prayer. Can you picture? I want to offer to you two that's in my life, has been in my life. Again, I offered one of these uh, when tonight. That was my grandmother. She didn't realize, she didn't realize that she was influencing me when she sat on the front porch and read the Bible and prayed. My grandfather was in very ill health and he was in bed most of the time, so she would go out right there and sit on the front porch and pray. A more recent example I want to offer to you about effectual fervent prayer. His name, at that time, his name, and I presume still is, Andre. In 1998, a godly woman by the name of Becky, I'll just give the first name Becky, in the city of Baton Rouge. She had a passion for winning the lost of Baton Rouge. And her calling, the way she lived out her calling was every Sunday afternoon, she would get some cookies and some balls and hula hoops and games and she'd go to low income apartment buildings and with those cookies, and ball and games should attract the kids of the apartment building. And I was blessed to get on Becky's team, and so I would go with her there every Sunday afternoon. I want to tell you, it was a mountaintop of experience. <laughs> and week after week, you learn the kids' names. And I learned Andre. Andre was about six years old. And the way we would do it, we'd have the games, and then we'd, after the games, we'd come and we'd sit down and we'd have uh, the cookies and, and the cokes, and then we'd have Bible study and prayer. And there one Sunday afternoon, Andre, keep in mind, little six-year-old boy, he prayed a fervent prayer, a factual fervent prayer. It, it moved me. And what he prayed was, I mean, his heart was all there, and he prayed, he said, Dear God, please bless and take care of my mother and my dad. I, I remember that line. We got through the prayer, and the kids sat it out and began to pray a little bit, and I asked Becky, I said, Becky, what, what, you know, why did Andre pray like that? And she said, well, last year, his dad killed his mother and then committed suicide in front of him. That's a sad story. But he brought out that little boy on a fictional firm of prayer. Programs is not going to reach these unchurched families around here. Neither will motion without meaning, whatever that is, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we believe that Jesus, and through prayer, that we can reach him. I began to close, and we're going down into the prayer time. We've got to engage the world and I realized here recently that I was uh, wrong because I was 
thinking, there's one family that I said to myself, they don't want to see me again. They don't, they don't, want, they don't want me to hear about it. And then I remembered Pastor Charles' sermon from April the 16th of last year, 2023. He rung my bell with four words. This is Pastor Charles. He said, love is never cautious. <laughs> we discussed that this morning in Sunday school. We go to them without worrying about whether or not they want to see us. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be worried about offending them. We should be worried about them going to the eternity in hell. All those children. I offer to you, as we pray here now and in the coming days, we have seven more days before BBS. That's going to be on the list of what we answered to for eventually. What did we do to reach that world around us for BBS? And I ask you, labor, us labor in prayer day by day for the next seven days so that all these children that n never hear the word except maybe at BBS that they'll hear it. And if you'll see it planted, it'll change them. And then the other thing I offer to you is praying for the lost. I offer this to you that happened to Sherry and I. About eight years ago, while we were in Texas, we, when we are in Texas, we always worshiped at the church that we used to be members of when we lived there full time. And we went there and we worshiped and the preacher it, it was an evangelistic message, and it was about reaching the lost. And, and he said this, said, uh, when you get home, or even now, write down the names of three people that are lost that you're praying for. I couldn't write down one name. church that day convicted and prayed be unto the Lord all glory, glory to him since that time there's always been one name at least one name on my list that I'm praying for by name We probably all know more than one person that's lost. Call their names out by name in prayer, laboring, laboring in prayer. And maybe more joy, like Dakota and Olivia brought, they're singing, maybe more joy will break out. <laughs> and, and some of that, the, the young people brought back from youth camp or be contagious and it'll get all over us. <laughs> so we're going to enter in now to whomever uh, we care to pray out loud. Uh, <clears throat> Brother Carl, I've spoken to Brother Carl and I know that uh, Brother Carl, you, uh, you're going to start us off in prayer and, and whomever else uh, we care to. That's not to say that we're not all praying, I'm just saying to whomever is led to pray out loud. Uh, let's pray that God will take us and use us to labor and, and reach the world around us. Shall we pray?